Okay, welcome everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, we are so pleased today to have a panel discussing the um, US-German transatlantic relationship in the wake of the United States election. Um, we are sponsored today by uh, two wonderful organizations, the IASGP, the International Association for the Study of German Politics, um, and the AICGS, the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Um, I am Sarah Williardi. I am an Associate Professor of Government at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing our three panelists. Uh, they will each speak for about eight minutes, give us a little bit of an introduction, um, and then we'll have some discussion and you will um, be welcome to submit questions. Um, we're asking you to use the question and answer feature on Zoom to do that. Um, so let me uh, go ahead and kick things off by introducing our three speakers today. Um, first, we have Jana Puglieren. Um, she's a senior policy fellow at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Um, she has, uh, she's also the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations um, initiative called Rethink Europe. Um, and she has advised the German Bundestag on security issues and foreign policy um, over the course of a, a long career. So I'm sure she's going to have some great insights about the German angle on things. Um, we have also um, Omid uh, Nouripour, who is a member of the German Bundestag uh, representing the state of Hesse. Um, he is from the Green Party. In fact, he took over Joschka Fischer's um, seat. Um, he has been on the Defense Committee and the Budget Committee and also the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Um, and he's a speaker for the Greens on migration issues and refugees. Um, and then finally, we have Jeff Refke, who is the president of the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies. Um, he has uh, had a long career at the State Department prior to being at AICGS. Um, he has uh, advised uh, NATO and the White House. Um, and so he's uh, going to also bring some insights from the American side of things. Um, AICGS also has a new publication that came out over the summer that I wanted to draw our attention to um, that is a, a kind of paper that positions, um, that gives advice to uh, whatever administration uh, was to take office on the US-German relationship going forward after the election. Um, all right, and I think we are uh, going to start things off uh, with uh, Jana Puglieren. Um, so why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, apologies if you will hear some noise. I have kind of my two boys around. Um, they are eight and 11 and I'm working from home because of COVID. So, um, but I think you're all used to this by now. Um, so uh, I want to give you the German, um, yeah, perspective on um, the, the, the American election and also um, how, yeah, the future of the transatlantic relationship is seen from um, Berlin or at least from, from where I sit. So um, in Berlin, the overwhelming majority uh, of the kind of political elites, but also I think of the broader population was really hoping for a Biden victory and um, on our kind of Wednesday morning when it was still unclear who had won the election and it seemed for a moment that Trump um, has made it again. Um, I think a lot of people had the impression that they were looking uh, in the abyss uh, because I think Germany would not have been prepared for other four years of a Trump administration. So under the last um, four years, uh, the relationship has significantly deteriorated I would say to an unprecedented low, um, even under um, kind of during the Iraq war uh, with the rift um, between Germany and the United States, I think we have never uh, been at such a low point in the relationship. And uh, seen from Germany kind of for now, um, for the last four years of Trump rhetoric, um, Germany was always singled out kind of as the least favorite US ally and we always, kind of were the bad guys on, on everything. That's how it felt over here. Um, so what worried most people um, most in, in Berlin was 
uh, the attempts, or how, how we perceived it, the attempts of the Trump administration to undermine the European Union, which uh, to us Germans is um, particularly dear to our hearts. So we kind of uh, feel very attached to uh, the EU. It's in our DNA. So that was kind of something that was really worrying and that uh, was also felt as a threat. Um, and also kind of broader attacks on multilateral institutions and multilateralism as such. Uh, so that's why you heard, I think, uh, an audible sigh of relief when it became clear um, that um, uh, Joe Biden had won the election. And uh, a lot of Germans are now hoping for uh, a better future. Um, so the perception is that many people that have been already working in the Obama administration that know Germany, um, that know Europe well, will come back in the administration and it will be much easier uh, to work with uh, a Biden administration. There are uh, very well established links to a lot of people um, that might join the administration. And so I don't know if we want to become kind of the United States most favorite ally again, as, as kind of President uh, Obama um, Set in, in, in his last months in office, but uh, there is really hope that we can work together and achieve something together. Um, so, the kind of the issues where the Germans think uh, one could very well work together and where we identify joint interests is, first of all, um, to work on climate protection. So, it's a huge relief for Germans to have uh, a president in the White House then uh, in January who believes in human made climate change. This is of really high priority uh, for the German population and also the German government. And here, um, yeah, one, one hopes to, to kind of uh, Kind of to achieve something together. Same is true with uh, a global response to the pandemic. Um, so um, there is a lot of hope that we can uh, coordinate and cooperate on global health um, again, also in the framework of uh, the World Health Organization, um, hopefully. Um, Germans hope that there will be uh, a new deal between um, uh, the United States and Russia on the New START treaty, um, and that we will make progress on, on arms control, on relations with Iran, um, and on the reform of NATO. I think people um, have been talking a lot about the necessity to write a new strategic concept and have put that on hold uh, during the last four years, but I think um, there will be this kind of renewed attempt um, now. What we think will remain uh, critical is uh, particularly Nord Stream 2. Uh, where uh, we understand that there is a bipartisan um, kind of uh, opposition against this, also uh, very, um, very present in Congress. Um, we think that our trade surplus is uh, going to be a difficult issue um, in the future and also defense spending. So um, that is something that, that Berlin, I think, is well aware uh, remains critical and um, that is, is, is uh, something that, that where kind of there are different opinions and that might be um, more difficult. So we expect as, as Berlin, or I think most people expect um, to have the opportunity to work on China. And I think I'm quite optimistic. Um, I I'm always told by, by my colleague working on China that the EU's perception of China and Germany's perception really changes. I think you don't see that um, yet in that kind of our close business ties and in this decisions that have been taken, the uh, language has really changed, and um, so the perception of China is much closer to the American perception, and uh, people here have argued that kind of this could be another glue for the transatlantic relationship, although people are well aware that there will be a lot of expectations and pressure from a Biden administration, and that it will be much harder kind of to say no to a Biden administration because we want to work um, together. So uh, overall, Biden is perceived, or the next four years are perceived as a chance to revive things. Um, but there is also a certain understanding in Berlin that people, uh, that things cannot go back to normal again. So that is kind of something that you hear over and over again, kind of that we need to brace ourselves, that we uh, shouldn't, that this is kind of the good old Obama days. This is, um, this is kind of new circumstances and we really need to adapt. Um, at the same time, uh, when you look a bit deeper what that means, there are basically, I think, two different interpretations and they have been very present actually since the election of um, Donald Trump in Germany. So there is 
one camp that um, has been arguing for the last four years and is still arguing that it doesn't really matter that much who is um, in the White House now. Although, of course, uh, it, the, the style changes and the tone and it will be much friendlier, but on substance, structural changes that had started under uh, the Obama administration or even earlier um, will survive. Um, that's pivot to Asia, the focus on uh, domestic issues, um, also kind of a certain disengagement uh, from, from Euro Europe and maybe diverging interests. And so this is this is one camp and the other camp basically says it matters a great deal who's in the White House, not only in style, but also in substance. Um, so we have um, a new chance here um, and we need a united West and these people still talk about the West as, as um, something that exists that that we need um, and that we can only work together vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and uh, Russia. Um, kind of we can we can only be kind of uh, united and strong um, no, it's strong if we are united vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. So it's in our interest to cooperate and it's also in the American interest to cooperate. And you see, basically you see this in, in German politics uh, with two op-eds, which I really encourage you to read. One is from our um, defense minister, Annegret kram karrenbauer and, and it's entitled, A Europe Still Needs America. And she basically says, uh, the West needs to stay united. We cannot defend Europe and achieve our goals without the United States. We are dependent. Nuclear deterrence cannot be replaced and we need a new joint agenda. And, and she re rejects the notion of strategic autonomy very clearly. She says that kind of it's a pipe dream, it's an illusion. We should uh, talk about this. Um, because the, the very idea um, she thinks is wrong. Um, so she was accused very much by the other camp saying, oh, she's a kind of, she's too, um, kind of, she's an old uh, transatlanticist. She is um, not really grasping the new situation. She is clinging to the good old past. She's not ready to move on. Um, and and uh, kind of, she by rejecting strategic autonomy, she's denying kind of reality and she's not, she should embrace it. So she got a lot of criticism for this. And there was a reaction from, uh, Omid may, might comment on this from Franziska Brandner from the Green Party, uh, a reaction to this op-ed uh, saying time for Europe to move uh, beyond um, uh, Pax Americana. Uh, it would be wrong to think that we can rely on US security guarantees forever. We should embrace strategic autonomy and this is kind of, um, yeah, we, 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 we need to move on, although we still can cooperate, but kind of the relationship will be kind of different and, and, and we, we shouldn't be as dependent as we have been. Um, the, the, and the last thing I want to say about this is kind of the sad thing about this is that we kind of since since this election actually took place, we are kind of discussing strategic autonomy uh, as a concept and we are not talking about substance because I think there is an, a consensus beyond beyond kind of the, the, the notion of strategic autonomy that the Europeans really need to do more. And the crucial question is, do we do this in an EU framework? Do we do this in a NATO framework? Um, do we do this in any coalition of the willing? So how can the Europeans get their act um, together? And there are, yeah, different, different uh, opinions. Um, and I leave it with this, I think. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, that's a, a kicking us off to a really good start. Uh, Omid, we're going to turn to you now, um, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you for having me. Um, let me start with a disclaimer question, which I cannot resist to ask you. Will Trump really go? Um, because, uh, just ask. Um, you know, um, the last, um, no, I don't want to talk about the last two years. I just want to elaborate our expectations and our hopes for, for the next four years, and especially the differences between the, the, our expectations and the, and the last four years, starting with a with mindset, which hopefully gonna change. Because you know, the question who, who, gonna be, who gonna be the choice of the American people is beyond my mandate. But of course we have our sovereignty and we have our issues. We had our issues with, with the current president of the United States. Jana just, just elaborated a couple of them. For example, the way he addressed uh, Germany's image in, in, in the world was not very friendly. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is mindset hopefully going to change, starting with a culture of, of dialogue. It's of course a question of, it's, it's, it's a question of the sovereignty of the United States and the this, this decision of the US administration to decide if they want to withdraw their, their forces, their armed forces from Germany or not. But we hope that there's going to be an administration at the other side of the pond which talks and then tweets. 
um, this would be very helpful. Of course, or give me, let's give me, give you one more example. I am opposing Nord Stream 2 for, for years, my, as my party does. We are fighting it all the time. But of course, we just cannot sit there and, and, and watch the American administration violating our sovereignty by bringing in secondary sanctions against our, com against our companies. I hope we're going to have an administration who knows the difference between pressure and, and, and sanctions. Because you know, the S word in the German public means we are threatened like a rogue state. Uh, and hopefully this is over. Um, part of the mindset is, of course, to understand that cooperation is, is, can, lead to, can lead to a win-win situation. And it's not a, the entire world is not only about winning and, and losing. And also the question of multilateralism already has been mentioned. Um, of course, China's influence in the, in, in, in the World Health Organization is too big. But if you want to change that, the worst thing you can do is just leaving the organization. And then this is why we believe in, in multilateralism and its institutions and hope that we're going to have a better common cooperation to have some pushbacks of authoritarian regimes trying to get more influence. I want to, I want to, and, and of course the question of systemic rivalry is, is key and I just don't want to repeat and but underline what Bajan just said. We just going to survive a systemic rivalry if we, 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 we stick together. If there is a real West existing there and, and, be, and a visible West and a visible alliance of democracies um, standing up to the authoritarians, especially to China, but also uh, to, to, to Russia. Let me come to, to a very brief list of, of policies which could be key for, for a cooperation, starting, of course, with the climate change. No way for, hum, for humankind to get to the goals of the Paris um, 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 agreement without the United States, by the way, nor without China. Um, second is trade. Uh, I know that the uh, TTIP was, is, is, is that on both sides, but finding a way to find to, to have a institutional way of, of, uh, of free trade between United States and Europe and Canada, maybe, um, um, uh, with very high standards, on, um, it would, would be, of course, a big benefit for, for both sides. Uh, foreign and security policy is a standard issue we, we are talking about all the time, of course. I would still, I would love still to, to talk about the, 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 the digital agenda of both sides, uh, which there are a lot of issues we have with. Um, the question of privacy and the American understanding of privacy, which is completely different than, for example, the German one, uh, is of course another issue we have to talk about. Um, the most important thing to me in these days is that no matter who is in, who in, who in the Oval Office or the Chancellor of Germany or in Brussels, no one can destroy this, this friendship of, of between, between people. And we have seen a civil society for the last few years in the United States was, was a role model uh, for, for, for all of us, the way they, they stood up to racism and, and then sexism. And, and this is, for me, the most important thing, the most important lesson for the last four years is to, to deepen these relationships. There have been a couple of things more, but we have to improve and we have to do much more. I think we can do a lot of more networks between, between the United States and then Germany and Europe. I want to finish with, with just, just, this is also repeating what Bajana just said. This is a, some kind of a last wake up call for Europe to stand up and then to, to wake up and to understand that we're just, of course, um, we, we are depending um, on the United States, but we have to, to bring, deliver much more than we did for in, in, in the past. The American cavalry won't come. When I try to understand what's going on in the United States, the domestic issues, the polarization, all of that, huge homeworks for the new administration are huge. So we have to ac accept that these things are going to come first. That means that we, got, we have to take a bigger part of the burden in the international politics. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, we're going to turn things over to you now for your uh, kind of opening remarks here. We've got a lot of really good discussion topics on the table already. Well, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. I also want to thank uh, Ed Turner um, and the International Association for the Study of German Politics for being our partner uh, in this event uh, today. 
and it's a great honor to be uh, on the on the same screen uh, with Yana Pugirin and Omid Noribor. Uh, I want to pick up with the uh, point that o Omid, uh, where Omid ended, um, and I'd like to uh, organize my comments in kind of four categories. Um, the first is sort of overall about the U.S.-German relationship. Second is about kind of the timelines and the difficulties uh, and the opportunities we'll see going forward. Um, the third is about China, and the fourth is about um, uh, engagement beyond the executive branches. So first of all, uh, you know, Omid talked about uh, Germany taking on additional responsibility. This is a mantra we have heard from, uh, from Germany since uh, 2014, um, at least. Um, and without judging any of that, I, I would just say, in my, in my view, Germany is the third most important country in the world. You could make the argument that others might you know, be in third place after the United States and China. But I think when you look at everything taken all together, um, uh, Germany's economic capacity, uh, its uh, technological advancement, its ability to lead within Europe um, and in the European Union, um, uh, as well as other factors. Uh, that is uh, where we should be starting in this discussion. Um, and so Europe and Germany need to play a, a key role in defining the transatlantic agenda. There is sometimes a tendency um, on the other side of the Atlantic to wait and, and, uh, and hear and see what a, an incoming U.S. administration will define to be its priorities and then figure out how to orient uh, in relation to them. Um, I think that's unhealthy for the United States. I think it's also, um, if I may say, uh, unhealthy for Europe. Um, and, and so that kind of passivity is a potential uh, problem. Um, so I think we, we need to have countries that uh, should play a leading role, uh, Germany not least among them, uh, engaging actively uh, in, in the coming weeks, uh, even before the inauguration, but certainly um, once uh, President-elect Biden takes office on January 20th. Um, switching now to kind of the timelines and the content of, of anticipated action from the United States and what that might mean uh, for the transatlantic relationship. Um, there will certainly be a more congenial atmosphere. Um, uh, that, is, that is important on its own, though it only goes so far. Um, uh, if I could also comment on multilateralism, I think the Biden administration, if you look at you know, pretty much anything in Joe Biden's record as vice president, as a senator before that, uh, he is someone who will look to work with American allies and partners. Um, it's part of his, it's in his DNA. But he is not a multilateralist simply for multilateralism's sake. And with a very divided Congress, you know, a razor thin majority for the Democrats in the House of Representatives, quite likely a Republican majority uh, in the Senate, or at best, an even division in the Senate, um, you know, he will not be a multilateralist, he will be a results oriented multilateralist. Um, he is not going to indulge endless process um, uh, that might uh, sometimes arise from, for example, the complicated coordination inside the European Union um, and so forth. So, so there, yes, this will be a multilaterally engaged administration, I think, um, but um, it is not going to be satisfied simply with having um, earned the label multilateralism. They're going to want to get things done. Uh, and then when we look to the, uh, to the agenda, there are certain immediate things that the Biden administration uh, can, can do on taking office. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned, and I agree with uh, the, the points, um, for example, with regard to rejoining the Paris uh, Climate Accord, which the uh, transition team um, has, has reiterated. Um, these things will set a tone and they will establish clear priorities and a, an overall direction for the Biden administration. And they will go, I think, uh, a significant distance toward ending the period of profound alienation that has characterized transatlantic relations for the last four years. Um, among other uh, steps that I might uh, put in this category uh, would be uh, an early visit to Europe, um, assuming that that is you know, workable under the uh, pandemic uh, restrictions, 
um, but at, at a minimum early engagement. Um, and that will include NATO, of course, which for the United States is uh, you know, the most important uh, you know, longstanding pillar of the transatlantic relationship. And you might see, for example, I think Yana, you mentioned this as well, um, a, a kind of formalized decision to launch a new strategic concept. That's uh, something similar to what happened in uh, 2009 when the Biden, uh, sorry, when the Obama administration took, uh, took office. Um, and we may want to talk a little more about that. When I worked on the NATO international staff, I had the, the, uh, the, the honor to be part of the drafting process for, uh, for the current strategic concept. Um, a further step will be re reinvigorating diplomacy with the, with the European Union uh, as a whole. There has not really been any, any, any serious uh, dialogue with the European Union uh, in recent years. And so um, re-engaging that will make uh, a lot of things possible. Uh, I'll talk about that more in relation to China in a second. And I think these sort of summits and travel opportunities uh, can also be the initiation of an ongoing high level, in my mind, hopefully cabinet level, uh, uh, you know, series of, uh, of regular consultations to set a common agenda to um, ensure that we pursue it on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and that we do so effectively. Um, the second category, beyond those immediate steps, uh, the second category, um, I think there are areas where the Biden administration will have transatlantic instincts, um, but where the uh, you know, making progress will take a little bit uh, more time. Uh, uh, Omid Nouripour mentioned the uh, US uh, troop drawdown proposals that uh, have emerged in the last few months from the Trump administration. Um, you know, I think there have been plenty of people uh, in and around the Biden campaign who have been critical of those, uh, of those plans. Um, but now that they've gotten started, I'm not sure you should expect the Biden administration to immediately take all of that off the table. There may be some sense in consolidating some of the U.S. military headquarters in Europe, for example. Um, there may be, and there's a legitimate discussion to have about where America's forward deployed forces are stationed. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if the Biden administration uh, takes some time to think those things through, no one should take that as an indication of some kind of Trumpist or America first uh, turn. Um, it is, but it is simply a natural development. I think on the trade side, you'll see a similar thing. Uh, no, uh, nobody uh, around the Biden campaign or the, neither or, nor uh, president-elect himself has been a supporter of the tariffs on steel and aluminum, um, and certainly not about the threat, the threat of uh, tariffs on automobiles and automobile parts. But that is different from saying that they will simply be wiped off the table. If you look at the domestic coalition that Vice President Biden uh, assembled in, in winning this presidential election, a large part of that was trying to, um, to restore the appeal of the Democratic Party to working class voters in the United States. And, and so uh, I think they will be careful um, and want to approach these things uh, in a bit more comprehensive fashion, um, rather than simply undoing everything that the Trump administration did. Those, um, you know, that is not an indication of a punitive uh, mindset like we've often seen from the Trump administration. Um, it is simply, um, um, you know, uh, they will be prudent in how they move forward, I would expect. And so we need to guard against disappointment or fatigue um, uh, on the part of Europeans if all of the problems aren't solved in the first six months. Um, it's going to take uh, time, um, and some may not be resolved at all. By the way, I would also say that any incoming administration while it's well aware of what the previous president has done, uh, they also have a certain amnesia uh, because they don't consider themselves responsible in some way for the, the, the things that have been done before them. Um, uh, so they're not going to go around apologizing for um, the Trump administration's policies. Um, uh, there, there's not gonna be a hair shirt mentality um, e even if they reject certain things that the Trump administration has done. Third category, um, are things that are simply hard and will take time. Um, developing a NATO agenda that goes beyond the burden sharing discussion we've had over the last four years, um, that's complicated, that will take time. Um, a, an EU-China policy, more on that in a minute, will take time, and also a more comprehensive approach to trade 
um, is, uh, is going to take uh, time. And then the fourth, um, I think Yana and Omid have touched on some of these already, but there are areas where either the United States and Germany disagree, the United States and Europe on the whole disagree, or where Europe is divided amongst itself. Um, and North Stream 2, I think, is, a, is an example of all three of those. Um, Germany is isolated within Europe to a significant degree. Uh, the United States and Germany uh, are, you know, for ever since the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was, was announced, the United States has opposed it, Democrats and Republicans. Um, and also the use of sanctions as a tool of, uh, of international um, economic and security policy uh, is an area where we disagree. And we are going to continue to have disagreements about this um, and we will need to work to close those, um, but that will, that's gonna be a source of friction, I think, throughout a Biden administration. Um, and that in, in no small part, because you could have a Republican control of at least one House of Congress. They're not going to lift sanctions that they've put into legislation already. Um, and, and so this is gonna be difficult. Um, third uh, topic I would touch on is China. I won't go deep on this, but I will simply, I think there has been a, a growing consensus, at least among sort of the transatlantic think tank community and certain uh, and people with transatlantic inclinations, that China policy can be a new anchor of the transatlantic relationship. Um, I think we should separate things that have to do with China and things that have to do with um, international affairs more broadly. China is second most powerful country on earth. Um, it is involved in everything. So there's a sense in which China policy is everything policy. Um, and we don't do ourselves well to turn everything into some kind of new, um, you know, um, adversarial relationship with China. Uh, there are plenty of things that are simply good, China, good policy that the transatlantic community should be talking about, which will also affect um, uh, China. Um, but then to go into at least a couple of areas, I think we should uh, talk about technology and standards. Um, that's been uh, mentioned as well. As much as we disagree about privacy across the Atlantic, uh, uh, Omid, um, the disagreement is vastly greater uh, between uh, the transatlantic community and China when it comes to digital privacy. So I think we need to find ways to focus on the things that we agree on um, and, uh, and focus on shaping the global environment rather than having transatlantic uh, arguments. Um, and, and that applies to a whole lot of other norms and standards, um, uh, whether that is in uh, digital communications and digital infrastructure, um, investment screening and export controls, um, and, uh, and so forth. So I think that there, that is a very fruitful area of, of focus. Um, uh, Sarah, you were kind enough to mention an AICGS report with some recommendations. Um, I would... Um, you know, argue against my own side and say there was also a very good report released recently uh, from the Center for a New American Security and the German Marshall Fund, uh, a joint report, which is about a transatlantic China policy. I think that's worth reading. You might even see some names on that report that correspond with names of people involved um, in the transition, for example, at the State Department uh, under the, uh, the Biden transition team. So the last thing I will say is about engagement that goes beyond the executive branch. That is crucially important. The president is the most important figure in our system, um, but the president has to operate within constraints. And uh, we've seen this in some ways as Republicans in Congress have tried to um, uh, place barriers around Donald Trump on things like NATO and transatlantic security, um, and also on things uh, like his trade policies. Uh, we will also see something similar uh, under a, a Biden administration. I think that's predictable. So having a dialogue between leading members of the foreign and defense uh, policy and other uh, policy areas in the German Bundestag with the US Congress, for example, in some cases, the European Parliament with the US Congress, these are gonna be crucially important. Uh, be, and I say that not just because we have Omid Nouripour with us today, um, uh, but because you know, the balance of power in the United States, the possibility of changing majorities in the Congress, and the ways in which Congress, um, in many cases, um, sets the, uh, the parameters of foreign policy, sanctions being a good example. Uh, it means that we need to have a broader discussion so that we have a more sustainable and uh, better and stronger continuity um, in our uh, transatlantic uh, approaches. 
By the way, it's also important because there's a Bundestag election in 2021. So the United States has an interest in, in ensuring that there is a, a broad support among mainstream parties in Germany for a transatlantic agenda so that it is sustainable beyond the autumn of 2021 and is not uh, focused exclusively on the coalition that's currently um, uh, in power. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you to everyone and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in, so I wanted to um, highlight those. Um, there's actually been a couple of questions about China. Um, so we just heard some of your thoughts about um, that relationship, which is a, a really complicated one, right? Um, and so we have two lines of questioning kind of coming in um, that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is thinking about differences between uh, a German slash EU response to China, which might be moving towards a kind of tougher approach um, versus a US uh, response. Um, and the other is thinking about internal divisions within Germany by party. So whether the CDU, for example, and the Greens see the relationship to China in the same way. Obviously, this is a really complicated question. Um, uh, Jana and Omid, maybe we could hear from you in that order, and then we'll sort of circle back to Jeff and see if you have anything additional to say after they've uh, commented on that sort of the constellation of relationships that go into figuring out how to handle China. Well, maybe um, I just start. Um, and so on China, I think the most important thing that divides us currently is the idea of decoupling. That is something that um, we in Europe think that uh, the US under President Trump has seen as kind of the solution to the problem and that from, an, from a European perspective is not desirable. So that is what you hear all over. So we cannot kind of, we have to find a solution within multilateral institutions. We have to, to kind of tame China. Um, so we have to concentrate on attempts to be more, to become more resilient towards China. And uh, we should um, cooperate on, on kind of maritime security in Asia more. But at the same time, I think many uh, Germans uh, particularly, it's different in France and, and in the UK, but in, in Germany particularly, have problems to, to think in military terms about China as kind of a military threat in the South China Sea and um, have problems to imagine a German or European role. Um, we have our defense minister, uh, she has just suggested uh, to send uh, some soldiers on, on, on a ship. And, but this is something that kind of when we think about China, it's still uh, for the population also kind of difficult to understand where the threat comes from and it's certainly not a kind of prim primarily a military threat from from a German perspective. Um, different, I, I would, I mean Omid can comment uh, much better on the party differences but um, so the, the China issue I think splits the, the conservative um, camp uh, quite significantly. Um, there, especially the question uh, of Huawei and 5G has um, split the the CDU, but there was very strong, I, I mean, and, and, and actually the chancellor and our um, minister for the economy have basically um, emphasized how kind of the economic relationship with China and how important that was. And uh, whereas kind of Nor uh, Norbert Röttgen, who is now running um, for, for, for the party leadership, he's one of the three candidates, maybe not the most um, likely one to succeed, but still he has kind of led a conservative um, kind of yeah, camp to, 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 to work against kind of hit the other wing of his own party, which I thought was impressive. And how I see the Greens, but Omid knows that much better, is kind of that they are very aware of the threat when it comes to human rights, uh, when it comes to Hong Kong and Taiwan, and they are, I would say, much more outspoken than, than many conservatives on this. Okay, Omid, I, go ahead. I did I think it was wrong to, to start your answer to the questions in the chat, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, we do not believe in decoupling because uh, I, I mentioned climate, but there are a lot of other issues, a lot of cooperation fields. We need China and we have to go on to working with it. Second, we have to contain it. By the way, what I'm missing all the time is a 
transatlantic uh, um, approach to get India in when we're talking about how to contain uh, with China. There are some, there has been a couple of um, steps from the American side from for the last 10 years, but I think it was not the full, full by a full heartly how we did it. We, we need India on that. There are, we have our issues with India also, but, but no containment of China without India. Um, one of the reasons why Xi Jinping could deliver this unbelievable speech in, in Davos in 2017, saying that they, they, they're going to pick up the flag of, of, of multilateralism, was the space the American administration just just gave him for, for that. Mm. We know that China is not believing multilateralism, neither in rule of law. Uh, they do just good, good weather multilateralism. They, they are multilateralists when they like it. They do not like it, they just leave. When we talk about international uh, law on, on Hong Kong or the South China Sea, they just run away. And of course, they, they already declared the, the systematic rivalry. Um, so it's absolutely important to speak about their weaknesses. And it is not only a question of, of just strategy, it's also a question of, of being credible. This is why we and my party won't stop talking about the human rights of, of the Uyghurs and then the situation of, of Hong Kong and then the situation of Tibet and, and all of these military threats we are seeing for, for more than two or three years uh, toward Taiwan. Um, you, there had been a very, very interesting op-ed of a friend of mine, Brennan Putikofa, who is the uh, chairman of the uh, China caucus in the European Parliament, saying that, of course, you have to stick to the one China policy, but we have to redefine that. This is, uh, I think this is a language which is absolutely understood in, in, in Beijing, and this is the way how we have to go on. And I just can't repeat what Janet has said. We have a much better un united front in Europe when it comes to China. When I say Europe, I always mean 27 minus Hungary, okay? But look at Czech Republic. Look at Czech Republic three or four, four years ago and the way they dealt with China. Look at it now that the president of the Senate uh, recently traveled with a huge delegation of people to, to Taiwan. China promised retaliation. What they delivered was canceling a piano deal. Why, you know, piano? No, not, I'm not talking about the way how I do not talk, but the, the instrument. They didn't buy a couple of, of, of pianos from Czech Republic. So it's okay. So so Czech Republic is, is very proud that they stood up to, to, to all of this, this rhetoric. And this is this is something absolutely new and we have to 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 maintain that. Uh, just one last example on that. Um, Serbia. Everybody knows this world famous presser of President Vucic kissing the, the, the Chinese flag talking about solidarity, European solidarity uh, might be a myth and only China is helping. What he did not uh, mention, but everybody now knows in Serbia, and this has been a huge backlash for China, the Chinese brought in 200,000 masks, which had been paid by the European Union. Okay, so, so uh, we are doing a lot of good things. We are absolutely capable, capable as the European Union here. We are not talking about it sufficiently. This is what we have to the change, but when it comes to China, it's getting better and better, and it's good. Okay, thank you. Um, if, Jeff, if did I you want just, to add to this? Um, the only thing I would add, but thank you for the uh, opportunity, is that the United States has a challenge um, to face, and that is to prioritize. Um, you know, one of, I, I think the Trump administration has gotten a few things right in, in diagnosing the, the problems, the issues that surround China's uh, growing role internationally. Uh, where they have fallen short is in deciding which of those things they can best influence and how to go about doing it. So it's never really been clear what the, you know, has the Trump administration's um, uh, ambition been basically to cut a bilateral deal with China that, uh, that creates some benefits for uh, and producers. Um, or is it to work more comprehensively to resolve um, the um, IPR, the uh, WTO reform, um, the technical standards issues that are going to set the, you know, the framework for the decades to come? And then you add in regional security. So it's been this inability to communicate clearly and consistently 
what we want to accomplish, and then to figure out who our partners are um, who might share that interest. So I think that, uh, that, that setting a, recognizing that we can't get everything we want, that's sometimes hard for us Americans, um, and then um, uh, actually going about developing the instruments and the tools of cooperation, that's the big challenge here. And, and I think you know, that's gonna put some, put some pressure on Europeans. Um, we've got a, a few questions coming up in the um, Q and A uh, box here, um, and so I, I did want to turn to one that uh, a potential for greater cooperation is with U.S. and German policies um, towards Russia under a Biden administration. Um, do we imagine that Russia might become a less politicized relationship in either uh, Germany or America? Is there a greater opportunity for um, convergence in policies of our two countries towards Russia, or how do we see this relationship um, or these relationships really shifting with the new American administration? Um, and I don't know who wants to say it. Uh, Omid, do you want to start with that? Great. It, to be honest, it depends on Russia's behavior. Mm -hmm. um, if they come back to, to, to international law and, and stop invading neighbor countries, hey, let's be friends. But they do not. And to be honest, there have been too many um, aggressions and, and, and uh, trials of, of interference in, in, in the middle of our society uh, uh, than that, then, then we could afford. And so the question of how to deal with Russia is absolutely decided in, in, in Kremlin. And we just can hope that they come back to the table of reason, but it didn't yet. And uh, of course, we have our or for, and I'm, I'm, I'm the chairman of the, of the German caucus on, on Ukraine in the Bundestag. Uh, we are talking all the time to our friends there and they hear from us that this is not only about Russian aggression, but also about reforms they are, they are failing at a lot of times. And we have to help them and we are trying to help. But at the end of the day, uh, the question of how to deal with Russia, uh, we are ready to, to cooperate with them and there won't be peace in Europe without, China, without Russia, but it takes two to have peace. Okay. Um, Jana, go ahead. So um, I think expectations in Berlin are, and I'm interested in, in Jeff's opinion on this, that um, kind of a Biden administration will continue to see, or will be very outspoken about Russia as an adversary. So um, perception here is that under the Trump administration, um, so for, for the Democrats, this has um, become, because of the previous election from 2016, um, that, that kind of Russia is clearly seen as an adversary to the EU and, uh, and NATO, particularly from a Biden administration, and that uh, a possible a policy will be um, a bit more hawkish. But what I think the Berlin is um, very happy about is that we won't see that contradiction between what comes from the president, where kind of under Trump, many people here were worried that there would be a deal between uh, President Putin and President uh, Trump over the heads of uh, yeah, the Europeans and, and, and uh, the so-called post-Soviet space. And so um, I think the expectation is that we will see more continuity uh, and, and cohesion um, in, in the approach. And I think that um, hope is also that um, there was actually quite good cooperation under the Obama administration after the Ukraine crisis, uh, some sort of uh, work share and a close, yeah, close alliance actually. And, and Merkel um, back then led the camp, the European camp. Um, and, 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 and so I think that, um, yeah, that, that this is uh, the expectation. Um, but I think what at the same time, so Berlin expects a hawkish uh, Russia policy. But at the same time, um, emphasis on, on um, disarmament and or arms control um, and, and the new START agreement. So um, we, we see these two uh, pillars, kind of a firm stance, but at the same time, much more openness to, um, yeah, to really um, talk with Russia and to, to, to find an agreement um, there. And yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, if I could uh, respond to those, I, I think uh, Omid made an extremely important point, and that is the, the nature of the relationship between the United States and Russia, and I think also between Germany and Europe with Russia, it depends on Russia's uh, own policies and behaviors. Um, you know, the, I don't think uh, a Biden administration is going to be looking for 
um, an adverse, it doesn't desire an adversarial relationship. It's simply that Russia's policies uh, and the ways in which it undermines the sovereignty um, uh, of neighboring countries and seeks to, to do so also on a broader basis uh, in Europe and in this country uh, is unacceptable. So, um, so I think that, uh, that, that that is, um, you know, it, it would be wrong to think that the Biden administration is going to come into office looking for some kind of a, um, a modus vivendi with Russia in which we give something and then Russia gives something. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right framework. Um, the one exception to that would be the uh, arms control issues that Yana mentioned, where um, the, the problems and the, the questions of strategic stability um, and the extension possibly of the New START Treaty and then work beyond that. I think those are all, those are, those are extremely serious. The Biden administration is gonna have serious people working on them. And so I think they will approach those um, with the gravity they, they deserve. One thing that will change, I mean, you know, we've had three different Russia policies simultaneously for the last few years. You know, there's been the president's approach to Russia, which is never to say a bad word about Vladimir Putin, to kind of, you know, sort of acknowledge some kind of, um, you know, that, that he might be right about certain things. Um, at the same time, you've had the bureaucratic machinery's uh, approach to Russia, which has very much been strengthening European security and the American role in it uh, through the European Deterrence Initiative. And then you've had a congressional policy, which in some cases has been even tougher. And it's been a bipartisan policy, which uh, has been pushing sanctions and so forth. Um, if I could come back one last thought, though, I wanted to leave on the um, Nord Stream 2 um, issue, uh, because that is, it's important in Russia policy. It is, um, it is not the most important thing in Russia policy, but it is one that will be with us. Uh, I, think, I think that the core of that, um, uh, of the Nord Stream 2 objection from the United States on a bipartisan basis, has always been the potential for that Nord Stream 2 gives Russia um, the ability to exercise, to coerce um, its, its neighbors and Europe more generally. Um, and in particular, Ukraine. Um, that's sort of the ground zero uh, of that. And, and so I think if anybody, I see that there was one question which was about how to resolve this disagreement about Nord Stream 2. So if I can jump ahead and uh, I think that First of all, it has to be through strengthened engagement that um, uh, ensures your, Ukraine's sovereignty. Um, and Germany, I think, as the country where Nord Stream 2 is gonna make landfall, um, has a special responsibility there. Um, second, um, I, there's a European dimension to this that Germany has only reluctantly gone along with, and that is to apply fully the third energy package and the, and the revised gas directive including unbundling um, in ways that ensure if Nord Stream 2 is completed, um, that it would, uh, it would not um, uh, undermine um, uh, the, uh, you know, both European solidarity, uh, but also um, it would not give uh, Russia undue influence. Uh, and I think this is one where Germany needs to think and think quickly about how they wanna deal with this because otherwise it's a real mess. Okay, great, thank you. So we're nearing the end of our time. We do have a, a bunch of questions now in the uh, Q&A, which we won't be able to address all of, but it just shows this is a, a pressing and interesting topic. And of course, we're only at the beginning of thinking about it. Um, I wanna give each of our speakers about a minute to two minutes to share any final thoughts that they have. Um, some topics that have been brought up are relationships with the Middle East, um, if there's any common ground for uh, digital policy um, and indeed the Nord Stream 2 issue, which um, Jeff just talked about. So those are just some ideas, but I um, would also ask everyone to keep it uh, short so we wrap up. Um, the other thing that I wanted to cycle back to is the idea that Jana introduced um, in her initial remarks about the interpretation of the relationship between the United States um, and Germany or the United States and Europe whether this is a relationship um, that is actually fairly independent of who is in the White House because it's uh, underlying interests that don't really change, um, or whether this shift in the administration will in fact matter for the relationship. So if we could hear from each of you on that topic as a kind of overarching theme 
and then any one or two of the uh, subtopics you'd like to pick up. Um, but again, just about a minute to two minutes each so that we wrap up. Um, and let's go ahead and um, we'll start with Yana and then go to Omid and then close with Jeff. So on the strategic versus uh, kind of Trump as an outlier question, um, I think there are strategic issues that will remain, um, kind of the pivot to Asia and um, the focus on, on um, kind of the domestic issues. Um, but I think that um, with Biden, we really have the chance to revive this. And I think um, the personality of the president matters a great deal. So um, I think it's both. Um, and I think that um, our, our president uh, Steinmeier has, has uh, given a speech today where he framed that beautifully. He said that kind of we, we really kind of need to have both a strong um, kind of European Union with also some um, kind of the ability to do more uh, in security and defense and a, a strong NATO and kind of that is no contradiction but one is the precondition um, a, a better capable Europe is a precondition for a better transatlantic relationship a more balanced one and I believe this so the, um, the the issues I wanted to address is um, back uh, on Russia because I forgot two things I think hope in Europe is that uh, the United States will be more outspoken when it comes to uh, issues like Belarus or Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, I think th there was a, a, a significant absence of, of the United States in the last four years on, on those topics. That is a, a big hope um, that we have. And also kind of a fear or, or kind of an, an upcoming topic that we have not discussed is, um, yes, disarmament, but um, we don't expect that the Biden administration would uh, rejoin the INF treaty. We think it's, it's dead. And so what comes next or how to guarantee strategic stability in Europe. We will have a debate about nuclear sharing um, in the next uh, German government. That is clear. Uh, um, and yeah, so, so the question about strategic stability in Europe post the INF treaty is, I think, some, something that needs, that needs to be discussed. Great. Thank you. Um, Omid. Thir Middle East in 30 seconds. Um, I would say uh, Europe's three priorities in the Middle East are first, uh, of course, uh, security of Israel, second, um, um, preventing the entire region to get nuclearized, and third, and to be honest, this is not a German um, foreign policy, but, but um, I think, I, my, my, I am absolutely convinced this is the right thing to do, to understand that stability is related to the human rights situation. And if these three, or at least the first two, which are official policy of, of, of my country, by the way, one of the reasons why we are stick, still going on trying to save the, the nuclear deal with Iran, if these three things are shared, uh, let's come together and talk about all of these huge problems in, in the entire region, starting with a, a weak human development we know, and ending with um, the question of Iran's um, aggression in, in, in Syria or, or, or Lebanon. And how to tackle it. Okay, thank you. Jeff. So um, uh, before I s wrap up, let me also just say thank you, Sarah, for uh, the, the excellent moderation and for being with us today. Um, so I, I think that we have, as Yana said, uh, the, Biden, the, the, the Biden presidency represents a, uh, an important opportunity to, uh, to revive transatlantic cooperation at the center of American and European uh, international engagement. And, uh, and so that is, of course, a burden on the, the administration that will take office here. But quite frankly, uh, whether that opportunity is realized uh, depends to a substantial degree uh, on how uh, our partners in Germany uh, take up that opportunity. And so I would return perhaps to the, the point I tried to make earlier, which is um, that there is, a, you know, there is a lot of discussion that uh, I see in the public, and I'm sure there's more uh, privately uh, uh, ab about this. And that is, uh, that is a good thing because we, we, will, we will need to have a, a, an effort from both sides of the Atlantic to restore this partnership to the shaping force in international relations that I think we would both benefit from uh, um, from having. Okay, I think those are wonderful words to close with. Um, I wanna thank everyone uh, for coming and listening today. We had a lot of wonderful insights from our panelists. 
Um, I'd also like to thank the um, AICGS and the IESGP for supporting this event. Um, we are uh, in an exciting time in this relationship and we'll see um, where things go over the next few weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you.